Matthew chapter number 16. I'm going to read some very familiar uh, scripture, uh, some that ought to be familiar to you, but uh, some scripture that is often misunderstood. Matthew chapter 16, we'll begin reading verse 13. The Bible said, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you, Lord, for being a good God. And thank you for the scriptures tonight. I'm glad, Lord, you loved us enough to save us. I'm glad you loved us enough to provide the church. And I'm glad you left, loved us enough to provide us the scriptures. And we have a, a holy word from heaven that we can depend upon. We don't have to worry or look for another. We have the truth. And God, we're certainly grateful for that tonight. Lord, it's only by your grace that I'm not in a cult somewhere tonight or I'm not uh, caught up in false religion. Thank you for the truth and thank you for the blessing of uh, having the truth and for having men of old who've taught it and uh, handed it down through the ages. And God, we bless your holy name. Now, I pray you'd bless those that are working with the young people on the other side. Lord, those young people face far more peer pressure than I did at their age. Uh, and Lord, I've faced enough, so I pray you would insulate them. I pray you would protect them, put a hedge about them. I pray as the Word of God is taught to them tonight, they'd hide it in their heart that they might not sin against thee. And God, I certainly pray if there's any in that uh, room tonight that does not know you, they'll come to trust in you before it's everlasting too late. And we pray the same here in the sanctuary. If somebody's lost, uh, that even tonight would be the day of their salvation. Uh, Father, I pray you'd bless. I pray you'd touch the sick and afflicted. I pray for Miss Crystal. You'd help her in her upcoming treatments. Uh, may all go well. And God, just uh, help her and touch her. I pray for uh, Miss Tammy's Uncle Johnny. You'd touch him the same. Brother J.D., uh, Brother Bobby, others that need uh, uh, help from heaven. I pray the great physician, Lord, would reach down uh, and touch them if it be your will. Uh, Father, we pray that, Lord, uh, you once again would use this unworthy vessel, uh, edify your people, encourage them, uh, enlighten them, uh, and certainly draw them closer to you than they've ever been before. Uh, God, send us uh, revival in these days, uh, and God, help us to see a harvest of souls come to trust in Christ. Uh, before it's everlasting too late. Father, we love you. Thank you for first loving us, for it's in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus, the most precious name uh, that's ever been spoken. The Lord Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention. I know these are familiar verses, uh, but I want you to notice, first of all, the debriefing. Uh, Jesus begins to ask his disciples uh, some questions. Uh, in verse 13, uh, he asked them, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Uh, he's asking them a question. He's debriefing them. Uh, they've been, been out amongst people. They've come back uh, and assembled to the Lord, uh, and he's asking them some questions. Verse 15, uh, he saith unto him, But whom say ye that I am? Uh, it's one thing for the world to have an ideal or a concept who they think Jesus is, uh, but you and I better know who he is. Uh, if you're saved by the good grace of God, you ought to know uh, uh, who he is. Uh, you ought to know he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Uh, you ought to know he's the bishop of your soul. Uh, you you ought to know he's your Savior. Uh, you ought to know uh, all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we see the debriefing. Uh, now notice, if you will, the deduction or what uh, their answer was to his first question. Uh, Whom do men say that I am? Verse 14. And they said, uh, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Uh, of course, they thought he might be John the Baptist for his cleansing. Uh, they might have thought he was Elijah for his praying. Uh, 
Jeremiah for his weeping uh, or uh, others for his message. Uh, but uh, listen, uh, there's a lot of people that know about him. But I'm glad I know him. Can I say there's a lot of all kinds of uh, so-called TV shows about him, but they don't depict him. Hmm? Uh, I'm glad I know him. Huh? I'm glad I just don't know about him. Notice, if you will, the definitive. Uh, I, I'm sorry, the discernment. Got ahead of myself. Look at verse 16. And Simon Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Aren't you glad that Peter spoke up one time here and he had the right answer? I mean, a lot of times Peter would speak up. Reminds me a lot of myself. I open my mouth and two feet fit in, huh? But here he has the right answer, and notice the discernment. The Lord said, you didn't figure that out on your own. Flesh and blood hadn't revealed that to you. Uh, uh, people in the community didn't reveal My Father, which is in heaven, re uh, revealed that unto you. Aren't you glad for discernment? Now, there's some people I worry about. They don't have a clue. Amen. But I'm glad for some folks that have some discernment uh, that understand a little bit about what God is speaking to them from the Scriptures. Uh, and then we find that the definitive. The Lord goes on to explain some things in verse number 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, let me help you with something here. Most of you know this, but you may not know this. Uh, everything in the Scriptures are there by the divine appointment of God. God breathed the Word of God. This is the very Word of God for us. Everything that God put in here is important. Every jot and every tittle. There are no mistakes in the Word of God. Now by the Word of God, I hope you know that I'm talking about for English-speaking people, it is the King James Bible. Uh, it came from the Texas Receptus, which was the received text, uh, the Greek text, the Southern Greek, uh, the common man's language, the language that the apostles uh, were inspired to pin it down with. Uh, and can I say, uh, the King James Bible is the only Bible you find in English that came from the Texas Receptus. Uh, every other modern translation uh, came from a, a tainted text uh, came from the Vaticanus text uh, uh, which was marred uh, which man put his hands on. Uh, uh, listen, God's the one uh, that gave us his word. Uh, he breathed it. Uh, it is infallible. It is inerrant. Uh, it is without question the very word that we can put our confidence in tonight. Uh, now those that are uh, naysayers, they'll say, well men wrote the Bible. Well go study the Bible. Holy men depended down as God moved upon them. Now listen, I can take out this ink pen. It's a nice ink pen. And I can lay it there, and that pink ink pen will never write a thing. It takes something or somebody to pick it up and then begin to scratch out the thought of the author who is using the pen. All men were was the ink pen. God pinned down his word for you and I. Uh, now, I said all that to say that when people read the Bible or so-called study the Bible, they don't pay very much attention. One thing that you got to pay attention to, and I, I hated English class. I loved English literature. And I know why I loved it. I loved li reading all that uh, uh, Elizabeth in English. I didn't understand why I loved that so much when I was in school 150 years ago. But uh, it, it prepared me for the King James Bible. Uh, uh, but I did not like English when you had to do all that diagramming sentences. You remember all that? Verbs and adverbs and adjectives and nouns and predicates and, and all this uh, punctuation means. That I hated those classes. Huh? You know, I liked math. I liked history. I did not like English. Huh? You know why I didn't like English? Because nerds took English. Hmm? I ain't going to say nothing, Brother Brian. Huh? No, I didn't like English. But I do now. Because it's important. Amen. And I'm glad that I even took those classes I didn't like so I'd have some understanding. Now, I said that to look at verse number 18 again. And I also say unto thee that thou art Peter. 
and then there's a comma. Now, a lot of people ignore the comma. A lot of people say that the Lord built the church on Peter. That's not what he's saying. Uh, to demonstrate it, the Lord looks at Peter. He says, thou art Peter. And he points to Peter. As a matter of fact, the name Peter means little stone. And then he goes on to say this, upon this rock, not the little stone, the rock of ages, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Huh? Can I say this, that Jesus constituted the church. He found it, and he called it out of this world. Huh? He's the one that called out the assembly. He's the one uh, that called the twelve disciples, knowing Judas was one of the devils, but he called him anyway. Uh, uh, listen, he called out the church. Uh, he founded it. He constituted it. Uh, he's the one that commanded the church. He's the one that taught the disciples uh, for three and a half years uh, so that when he went off the scene, they would carry on what he taught them. Uh, can I say he's the one that compensated for the church? Uh, he paid for the church uh, in his own blood. Uh, He's the one that commissioned the church uh, after he rose again uh, and he commissioned them uh, what they were to do. Uh, 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 isn't it amazing? The last uh, command he gave, the Great Commission, most people aren't interested in today. What is the Great Commission? Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. Uh, he commissioned the church, gave the church its mar marching orders, uh, and then he certified the church on the day of Pentecost uh, 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 when the Spirit came uh, and it dwelled them uh, and gave them the power that they'd been praying for uh, uh, for some 10 days uh, and he certified it let everybody know uh, uh, it had his authority on it uh, it had his anointing on it uh, and it was accredited from him uh, for him. The church did not start at Pentecost. How can you add 3,000 souls to the 150 and it start that day? What about the other 150 in the upper room? Hey, the church was just empowered on the day of Pentecost. Say, when did the church start? In Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus sent them out two by two, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Listen, thanks be to God for the church. Hallelujah. Amen. With that in mind, I want to preach tonight on God's government. On God's government. Can I say that the number 12 in the Bible is very important. It means God's government. In the Old Testament, you find in God's chosen people, He had the 12 tribes of Israel. You find in the New Testament he had 12 apostles. Uh, can I say this? Uh, the 420 elders in glory uh, is going to make up the 12 apostles uh, and the 12 uh, 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 of the tribe of Israel. Uh, can I say this? Uh, uh, the church of the wilderness uh, that uh, God uh, showed Moses the blueprints up on the mountain and he gave the law and gave the commandment. Uh, the church of the wilderness uh, is the blueprint uh, for the local church today. Uh, uh, the church is God's government uh, on earth today. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.15 uh, concludes with this thought, uh, which is the church of the living God, uh, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Uh, can I say the church is here to be not only a lighthouse to sinners, uh, but it's to be God's government. Uh, it's to be the pillar. Uh, it's to be the ground of the truth. Uh, it is to be without spot, without wrinkle. Uh, it is to what everybody is to look to, uh, to know the mind of God uh, and the will of God for man. The whole duty of man is for us to glorify God and worship Him and live for Him and be an example of what He will do in a person who's repented of their sins and turned unto the Lord and what God can do in that individual. Take us out of the rudiments of this world. Make new creatures out of us. Put us in the family of God and give us direction in this life to live a life that pleases Almighty God. We're not to live like the world. We're to show the world how you can live for God when God lives in you. Our example is not 
Human agency, our example is Christ. And we're to live as Christ. And the local church is God's government. Now, when I speak of the church, I'm talking about a baptized body of believers, uh, local New Testament visible baptized believers. I'm talking about the local church. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, can I say this about the church? The church is a theocracy. As we find in the church of the wilderness, Moses would go on the mountain and commune with God. And God would speak to Moses his will for the people. He gave Moses uh, uh, the tablets written by the finger of God. Uh, and he went on to give Moses not only the Ten Commandments, uh, but some 600 more commandments uh, for Israel. Uh, he instructed Moses... Uh, how to build a tabernacle. He instructed Moses on how to uh, uh, cause Israel to uh, move in certain camps uh, where they were all divided in sections. Uh, and if you could look uh, from uh, above and look down on the tabernacle, you'd see the 12 tribes of Israel, the smaller ones at the top, uh, uh, the medium ones to the side, uh, the bigger tribes to the south. Uh, and it viewed a cross, my dear friends. Uh, and he instructed them how to sacrifice. He instructed them uh, uh, the will of God for their lives. Uh, God spoke to Moses. Uh, Moses spoke to the people. Uh, and when the people did the will of God, they had the blessings of God on them. Amen. When they disobeyed God, they faced judgment. Can I say, the church is not a democracy, it's a theocracy. God speaks to his man, his under shepherd, and as long as he's preaching the word of God and minding God and people mind God through what God says, uh, God will bless but when people stub up on God's man or stub up on God, God cuts off the honey pot and cuts off the blessings. Huh? Now I said the church is a theocracy, but the church is something unique. And I'll get to it in a minute, but the church has two sides. There's the spiritual side. That's what we always see, the worship. But then there's the business side. The business side, everybody has a say how we spend the money. We're to be good stewards of the money, and we're going to spend big money. We ask for your uh, vote on it. If everybody uh, confers, then we do it. If they say no, then we don't do it. That's where your democracy comes in. The problem with a lot of modern-day churches, they want the business to oversee the worship. Hmm. Business is important, but worship is most important. Uh, let me give you some things about God's government. And I'll hurry, because I ain't even got to the four words yet. Can I say, first of all, God gave us insight for His government. He gave us, in His government, guidelines or His authority. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That doesn't mean sinless. That means uh, complete, mature, whole, uh, truly furnished unto all good works. Uh, can I say the authority for each and every one of our lives and for the church is the Word of God. Hmm? Anything that bypasses the Word of God, don't care what it is, it's wrong. Anything not built on the Word of God will stand. Uh, it is our guideline. It is our authority. First Peter 1 Peter 1.25, But the Word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the Word uh, which by the Gospel is preached unto you. Uh, Psalms 105, For the Lord is good, His mercy and His everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God. Let me stop right there. Many people read the Bible. Few study it, even fewer know how to rightly divide it. To read the Bible is to read the Bible. To study it means to search out what it is saying. To rightly divide it means that in your study of what it is saying, uh, you rightly divide it, especially if you're going to teach it for doctrine, uh, you rightly divide it by seeing who it's talking to, uh, what it's talking about, uh, and uh, find it in the same context written to the same people about the same uh, thing in other places. Uh, in order for it to be a doctrine, there has to be two or three witnesses of it. 
That is rightly dividing it. Know who it's talking to, what it's talking about. I say there's over 300 different religions and denominations in America today, and most of them are built on somebody taking a verse out of context in the Word of God. Mm -mm. There are denominations, their whole premise is all taken out of context. And when you show them truth, they don't want to hear it because they've been brainwashed to their non-contextual pattern of study. Well, 1 Timothy 4.13 says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Today, doctrine is a dirty word. People say, lay aside your doctrine. Let's all come together under the name of Jesus. Well, if you lay aside your doctrine, you don't have Jesus. Because doctrine is the study of the Word of God. And if we don't come together on the Word of God, we have nothing to come together on. Uh, and by the way, this is the written Word. He's the living Word. And Paul said, uh, even if an angel from heaven preach unto you any other gospel that, other than what he'd preach unto you, let him be accursed. Uh, and listen, uh, our authority, our guidelines are the Scripture. I'm glad everything we do here at the Manuel Baptist Church is done based on the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Huh? If we're not going to have the Bible involved, we're not involved. Because hmm? I don't know if you know this or not, but our opinions can be wrong from time to time. Our feelings can be wrong from time to time. Our intuition can be wrong from time to time. Hmm? Case in point, I'm going to pick on my wife. I'll pay for this all week. This don't happen often. You better take notes. Hmm? I don't have any problem picking on you because I don't go home with you. Thank the Lord. Well, my darling wife, you know my darling wife. Now listen, let me just preface this. I'm the one who gives everybody the benefit of the doubt. She can look at somebody most of the time, and her first impression is right. She has told me, I told you so many a time. Oh. Uh, Look, somebody come in and say, oh, that, 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 that preacher seems like he's got something about him. She said, better watch that booger. Only for time to tell, that booger was a, a booger. Huh? When she first met Brother Adrian, her first impression was, he's a stick in the mud. <laughs> she did. She, she said true. She said amen. Only to find out that he's a jewel. He's a blessing. He's humble. He's starting to come out of his shell. He actually pick on you a little bit now. Huh? Uh, she said, oh, how much I get out of teaching and preaching. Hmm? Huh? Well, she never would have dreamed that when she first met him. Huh? Because Brother Ron, he's not a hillbilly like you and I. Hillbillies, man, you throw some pinto beans and cornbread on it, it's good. But he's a little more reserved. Now he's going, I'm a hillbilly. You're from Virginia. You ain't no hillbilly. Uh, what I'm trying to say is sometimes our intuition may not be right. But you know what is always right? The Scriptures. And aren't you glad because He changes not, the Word of God changes not, it's forever settled in heaven? It's our guideline. It's our authority. There's been many people come to me and they get, they're all flustered and they're all mad and they're all huffing puffy and they all got this and they want to say this, want to say this, want to say this. And when you open that book, things change. Because how are they going to argue with what God says? Hmm? We find that God's government has guidelines, authority, it's the Scriptures. But we also find in God's government, governing. You say, what are you talking about governing? Well, why would you have a government if it's not to govern? And can I say this about the governing of God's government or His local church? It's to be autonomous. You say, what does that big word mean? It means self-governing. Listen, a church down the street or church the next county or a church on down the road, a, a church uh, somewhere else uh, could be independent, fundamental, walk right, spit right, keep it tight, everything the same way we would normally say. But if they choose to do something different in their church, uh, who am I to judge that? Let me just say it like this because that didn't go over very well. I have a 24-hour day job taking care of me. 
let alone worried about judging somebody else. But could I say that? In the ministry of our church, I don't have time to worry about what somebody else is doing. We've got our church to take care of. Huh? And just because somebody else uh, uh, chooses uh, 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 to have uh, a piano and an organ and an orchestra, and I've heard people throw off on that, who cares? If they're worshiping God and they're minding God and doing what God says for their local assembly, I say hallelujah, and I really don't care because it doesn't affect me. And if they're wrong, God will take care of that. Huh? But somehow, we've got today an age where we've got these Holy Ghost Junior Baptist popes that thinks it's their job to make certain everybody knows who's doing something right and who's doing something wrong and all this and all that. And hogwash, huh? Just go take care of your flock and don't worry about it. Hmm? Uh, uh, we've got folks that get all messed Can I say God governs his local church and can I say, we have a way to govern God's government. And we're to be autonomous. And in every local church, hopefully, some are without one right now, God's got a man. You see, Jesus is the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd. And he has an under-shepherd. And the under-shepherd's called by the pastor, the bishop, or the elder. He answers to Christ. It's his job to get the mind of God to help lead the flock and direct the flock. I know you know this. Uh, but it's important to understand that God governs through his man. And it's important to understand that God's man has a lot of responsibility and a lot of pressure and a great burden on him. He watches for your soul. Hebrews chapter 13 tells us in verse 7, Remember them which have the rule over you. That sounds like governing. Uh, I've heard people say, well, you don't have to listen to your pastor. Well, you don't have to, but you'll be out of the will of God. Uh, remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God. That sounds like the pastor to me, doesn't it? Uh, whose faith follows. That means if he's following God, you follow him. Uh, considering the end of their conversation. Verse 17 says, obey them that have the rule over you. Now listen, if God says it one time, it's important. But if he says it twice in the same chapter, you really better pay attention. Again, he says, obey them that have the rule over you uh, and submit yourselves. Uh-oh, we don't like that term. It's taken Miss Veronica a long time to get Brian to submit to her. But anyway, he finally has. Huh? Uh, submit yourselves. Why? For they watch for your souls uh, as they must give an account uh, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is, in, uh, in, un, impro uh, that is unprofitable for you. Uh, let me pick on somebody else. Brother Donald, I'm glad God saved you. I'm glad he saved you out of Catholicism. You've been a Jew. And part of my responsibility as your pastor is to pray and pray for your family and certainly seek the will of God and so that I can have something for you. When you come with your, your bucket turned upright, you can feast on what God has to say. And your joy, you've never given me one ounce of problems or anybody. Now, she has, but you've never given me one ounce of problems. But listen... If you get sideways with me and all of a sudden you become a detriment for me having to pray over you because I know you're going through things you don't agree with me and you're causing problems and all that, that's not unprofitable for me. It's unprofitable for you because you've got the wrong spirit. And there's some people that go to church with the wrong spirit. That's not profitable for them. Uh, you need to consider the conversation of the pastor because he's watching out for your soul. It amazes me how many men of God will get up and preach and try and uh, uh, win people's families out of hell and how they'll be good to that person, how they'll visit them uh, when they're sick, how they'll visit them in the hospital, uh, how they'll pray over them, how they'll spend time with them, how they'll counsel with them. Uh, and all of a sudden, somebody comes in uh, uh, with some shiny trinket and they're ready to ditch the man of God uh, and run after that, huh? never considering all that that man of God has put in them because they don't want to be governed. Hmm? Can I say the Bible says a lot about the pastor. He's to be the overseer of the flock. Acts 20 and 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves uh, and to all the flock which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Can I say the man of God is to feed the flock of God? Hmm. Now, one thing that humbles me 
is how many of you drive from so far distance? Yeah, we have folks that drive three different states to come to church here. And I'm talking faithful. And it humbles me. Uh, but one thing I've heard Brother Bob Anders say, it's no detriment to drive the hour and something he drives if you're going to get fed. Huh? Listen, how many of you know anything about the Louisville area? Fad. There's a restaurant just outside of Louisville, which Brother Thad and Miss Tammy took Miss Annette and I to, to one time on our anniversary, called Stony River. It's about 90 minutes down there at Stony River. They got steaks, Brother Ron. They cut that meat and they age it for 28 days. And then when they bring that steak out, you don't put no steak sauce or nothing. You cut it with a fork. And then they got these caramelized mashed potatoes. And they got these little r rolls with cinnamon butter. Am I making you hungry? Huh? What I'm saying, there have been many trips since then that I have driven to Stony River to eat one of them 28-day-old age steaks uh, and to shove them mashed potatoes down my, my, my face uh, uh, because it's good, because it's worth the trip. Uh, it's worth the cost uh, of how much that meat cost to me to eat that. Uh, why? Is it because it's worth the trip. Uh, hey, as God's man, it's my job to get in the Scriptures, get the mind of God, uh, let the Holy Ghost speak to me so I can stand uh, and put out uh, God's buffet for you so you can come uh, and feast. Uh, how many times have you come to the house house of God uh, and you're seeking something from God you've had a terrible week uh, you've faced hardship uh, and you come in and God dump on your plate exactly what you need uh, give you the help give you the promise uh, give you the encouragement uh, uh, to keep you going another mile that's what the man of God's to do Amen. the man of God's not to be a babysitter he's to be the man of God and I'll say this about Brother Thad. Years ago, y'all think I pick on Brother Thad. You don't see the behind the scenes. Years ago, he gave me a pastor survival kit. I opened it up. It had pacifiers and diapers and all kinds of teething rings, all kinds of stuff for babies. Huh? You, know, you never saw that. But see, that's not the man of God's job, to be a babysitter. He's to be the overseer. Can I say as being the overseer, he's also to put people in place so they can help, so they can extend and work in the ministry. One man can't, can't do it all. And I'm thankful we have people that take part, that help in the ministry, that help us be everything that our church is. What a blessing. He's to be the overseer. He's to be the leader. He's also to be a servant. He's not to lord over the sheep. He's to serve them. Hmm? Some of you get mad at me every time we have dinner around here because I go last. You know why I go last? Because I want to put you before me. Huh? Now, I know some places they don't do that. But I won't go last. Why? Because I want to put you all before me because you're God's elect. You're God's children. You're God's sheep. You're God's family. You are the choicest of the choice. And I'm still amazed you come and hear me preach. And so I'll gladly wait so you can eat. He's to be a servant. He's to be an example. You know why there have been times that we've been in the hospital or Miss Annette's had surgery and stuff and you didn't know about it till afterwards? Because we're to show you that our dependence is on the Lord. Our faith is in Him. We're to be an example to you. There are some people get a hangnail and they want the whole church to know about it. Preacher, I got a hangnail. Will you call the prayer chain? Nope. This is for emergency only. This is a recording. Call Brother Adrian. Uh, why is it we're to be an example? I really believe the Bible. I really believe in and on the Lord Jesus Christ. I will really believe that long before it ever gets to me, it's got to go through His hand. I really believe that if it comes to me, He has ordained it for my life. That doesn't mean I'm always going to enjoy it, but I'm going to trust Him regardless because He does all things well. I really believe that. 
He's to be an example. Can I say the man of God's to be given to prayer and the word of God? Acts chapter number 6 and verse number 4, the apostles said this, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. 1 Timothy 5.17, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. Now I'm going to upset some of you. Don't mean to. It's just my nature. Nowhere in the scriptures do you find that it's the man of God to run down to the hospital, pay hospital visits, to run down to your house and wipe your nose when you got the cold or the COVID or the flu or whatever else you got. Nowhere in the Bible is that taught. Yet that has been practiced in other denominations and there are people who believe that's the pastor's job. Well, let me help you something. The pastor don't have a job. He has a calling. And if the pastor chooses to come visit you in the hospital, that's his choice. And if you're in the hospital, I'll try my best to be there for you. If the pastor chooses to pay you a visit, that's just an extra benefit to him coming by and spending time with you. But it's not required of the man of God. I know some people got, you know, get mad because the pastor don't come by and sit down and have a cup of coffee with them once or twice a month. Huh? If I did that with everybody, I'd never be given to the word or to prayer. Hmm? Uh, and by the way, the Lord in his government and in his governing set up somebody to take care of the sick and the needy. You said that he did? He sure did. They're called deacons. Hmm? Now, I know some of you think it's the deacon's job to run the pastor. Au contraire. And God help our deacons if they try. We'll be looking for new deacons. Huh? But listen to when they first appointed deacons. In Acts chapter 6 again, in verse number 1, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians uh, against the Hebrews. Of course, there's always division when you got two, uh, uh, you got Greeks and Hebrews together. huh? But anyway, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Uh, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, uh, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Uh, the first deacons were appointed to serve the table of the pastors, so the pastors could be given to the word. They were appointed to be able to take care of those situations that are important, but are not more important than the man of God getting the mind of God. The most important thing the man of God can ever do is get the mind of God for the flock. So we find that he appointed deacons to do that. Deacons are to serve, and we are blessed with some, some godly deacons. By the way, we, we appointed them both a long time ago. And you know why they're, they're serving in that capacity? Because long before they were ever deacons, they were servants. And that's the first qualification. Hmm? That a man is a servant who doesn't feel worthy that's the first qualification of a man of God, and that's the first qualification of a deacon. Somebody that thinks they deserve it, they certainly are not worthy of it. I don't have time. If we had time, you can look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, down from verse 1 down to verse 13, you find the qualifications for the pastor, for the bishop, and for the deacons. Huh? So God governs. He's got a governing body within His government, pastor and deacons to carry out the business of the Lord. And again, there are other peoples who are, who are appointed to serve and help in the ministration. Uh, let me get to the third point. Some of you are about to pass out. We've talked about the guideline, the authority. We've talked about his governing and, and the autonomy of the church. And then there's the gathering or the assembly. That's what we've done tonight. We've come out from the world, and we've assembled here tonight to worship the Lord. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, the Bible says, Let all things be done decently and in order. 
I've been in some places where it was a free-for-all. That's not the will of God. Everything's to be done decent and in order. Hmm? Now listen, the Holy Ghost still has to have free course in the service. We started the service. I had no idea that Miss Veronica was going to be singing. But while Miss Brittany was singing, the Lord put something on my heart. I had to look it up. And he said, ask Miss Veronica to sing. So I asked Miss Veronica to sing. She got up and sang, and that was a blessing. Can I say that was not programmed, but it still was decent and in order. All right? Can I say the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, 15, the first part of that verse. We read the second part earlier. The first part says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Hmm? We need to know how to behave in the house of God. The house of God is not to be a concert. The house of God is not to be irreverent. The house of God is not to be any place where the man of God's preaching and somebody jumps up and starts back talking. That's all out of order. And so through the scriptures and through Pauline epistles, we know how to behave ourselves outside of church and inside of church. And things will be done in decent order. I'm not going to go read 1 Corinthians 14 and, and bring all that out. We've, we've studied that in times gone by. If you need me to go into it in, in great uh, dissertation or whatever, um, come see my wife. She'll straighten you out, okay? All right. The definition of order is regular position or methodical arrangement of things, extensive application, proper state, Adherence to the point in discussion according to the established rules, uh, established mode of proceeding, uh, a settled mode of operation, a mandate, precept, command, or authoritative direction. Hmm? A lot of people say, why does Brother Doug pre pick who gets to sing? Because the Lord puts it on my heart, that's why. Uh, I'm just giving authoritative direction. I remember when I first became pastor here, Many, 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 many moons ago, going on 25 years, Brother Clint was the full-time song leader. Now he's one of our song leaders. we got th three. And Brother Ray, he's in the bullpen. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I tell Brother Clint, pick somebody up to sing. Well, he'd come back to me and said, well, I've asked them, and they said, no, they don't want to sing today. I said, I'll handle that. You, come sing. That's where it all started. Huh? It's funny, when my daughter-in-law, when she first started dating Christian, first started coming to church here, she's scared to death. I was just going to look at her and tell her to come sing. She said, I don't sing. I don't know. She said, trust me, he's not going to, he knows who can sing, and he knows, you know, he's not going to call on you, but I might. You never know. Huh? Listen, spiritual order is accomplished through awareness and obedience. There are some people cannot be in spiritual order because they're not aware. They have no clue what's going on. Hmm? They, they have no idea that while we're having services, there are forces of evil trying to disrupt our service. Amen. That's why you can be sitting in church get the most ungodly thought. Who do you think put that thought in your mind? Huh? And they're, they're folks that are just not aware of what is really going on. Can I say, in the church, there's a divine order for the practice of worship. There's a divine order for parliamentary procedure, church discipline. Thank the Lord we don't have to go through that very often. Very rare. Praise the Lord. huh? But there's also a divine order for propri proprietary decorum, business. We'll take care of that in a little bit. So we see that in the church there's the gathering, there's the assembling. There's also, here's where it goes bad, Brother Brian, either one of you. In governing, in God's government, there's giving. Or allocating. I knew I wouldn't get any amens right there. Luke 6.38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. 2 Corinthians 9.7, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Uh, it's the same thing. 2 Corinthians 9.7 says this, uh, uh, That God loveth a cheerful giver. The church is not to be funded by rummage sales, Amen. bake sales, uh, yard sales. I had somebody one time ask if we could have a yard sale out here in the front yard. I said, no. said, uh, God's people aren't beggars, and the church isn't broke, and we're not doing that. I said, if you want to have a yard sale, have it at your yard, and if you want to give all the money to church, give it in the form of an offering. But we're not having no yard sales. The Bible makes it clear 
that the church is funded through the tithes and offerings of the people. And we're to take those up on the first day of the week. Now listen, the tithe is that which is God. That is an act of obedience when you give back to God what is rightfully His. Hmm? God doesn't, He didn't have to give it to us, but He does. And it's a privilege to give back to the Lord. That's an act of obedience. He tells us to, commands us to, and when we do, uh, He's honored in that. He, he told us to bring our tithes into the storehouse that there might be meat in His house. We find uh, the tithe. Then there's the love offering. That's that which is ours, and that's an act of love. When you give a love offering, when you give an offering, that's an act of love. It's yours. Uh, it's not required of you. Uh, but when you give an offering above your tithe, uh, that's an act of love. By the way, you cannot outgive God. Hmm? Uh, and then uh, 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 there's uh, the faith promise or the mission, off mission offering. Uh, that's that which we don't have, uh, but it's an act of faith. If God puts it on your heart to give a, a certain amount to missions, and you might not even know you're going to have it, but yet God says you're going to, uh, to give it, and by faith you say, I'm going to give that every month, uh, God will always provide that which He's put in your heart to give to missions. And thank the Lord, huh? And by the way, it's not in my notes, but I might as well just go ahead and say this. There are three things that causes God to bless the church. A church that's evangelistic-minded gets the gospel out. A church that's mission-minded, that sends support to missions in, you know, beyond our Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. God blesses a mission-minded church. He blesses an evangelistic-minded church. And He blesses a church that takes care of her pastor. Our church has been guilty of all three of those things for 25 years. And that's why God has been so good to us and why we're looking to build another building. Because God is... If we'll do our part, I promise you, he'll do his part. I've been in many churches where they don't take care of the pastor. I've been in a church here recently, last few years. Pastor been there over a decade, never got a raise. They don't even think about giving him a raise. Matter of fact, I've even preached that they ought to give him a raise. They don't care. Huh? I've been in churches that don't support missionaries. Oh, they'll have a couple. I was in one church one time, had 10 missionaries they supported, but had $300,000 in the bank. You think God's pleased with that? And by the way, if the Lord takes His church out of here tomorrow, where do you think all that money goes? It's not going into kingdom. It's going to the Antichrist. I'd rather be guilty of giving it to the kingdom now, getting it out to missionaries who can be uh, uh, taking it to uh, uh, spend on tracts and Bibles and taking the gospel to people that's never heard it than to hoard it up. Thank you, Brother Phil. Uh, we're to be good stewards of God's money, but we're not to hoard it. Uh, and can I say, and I've been in, I've been in churches that they're not evangelistic-minded. They don't, they don't knock on doors. They don't invite anybody to church. They don't give out gospel tracts. And they wonder why they're dying, why they're drying up, why there's no blessing of God, why there's no revival, why they're not governing God's government, God's way. Uh, let me give you the last thing since a couple of you have already passed out. Talk about God's government. And the last part I just alluded to, going. Uh, that's action. Nowhere in the Bible do you find where we're to sit on the premises. We're to go. Uh, you know why in the book of Acts God blessed? Because they kept going. And the more they were persecuted, the more they told about Jesus. And the more they showed they had Jesus. Can I say, the Bible says in our Great Commission verse, Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to deserve all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Paul even told uh, uh, Timothy to uh, teach men that they may teach others also. That is so important uh, to win them, uh, 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 to disciple them, that they can tell somebody else about Jesus.
Acts 1 8 but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth can I help you with something this is not made to offend you but the, the Lord did not give us the Holy Ghost so you could have peace in time of the storm the Lord indwelled us with the Holy Ghost so we could be witnesses unto him so we can shine his lights and so we'd have the power to tell others when our flesh was intimidated by others Hmm. and I say the church is to evangelize the lost we're to edify the saints of God we're to educate converts we're to establish other churches we're to exalt the Lord and we're to embitter the devil pester him to death till Jesus calls us home what a blessing to be a part of God's government on earth the church thank God for the church you know my stand. Anything that bypasses the local church is wrong. I don't care what it is. Don't care how good the intentions are of it. Mm -hmm. Listen, I don't hold much esteem for these guys that have their name ministries. Mm -hmm. If it's not a local church ministry, the Lord's not going to bless it. Uh -uh. And if you see anything with my name attached on it, you can write that down as a failure. But you see something with the Lord's name attached to it, now business might pick up. Hmm? Uh, thank God for the church. What a privilege to be a part of the church. What a privilege to be able to assemble together. You realize without the working of God in our lives and without Him fitly framing us together, most of us would have never met one another. And look, He's not only brought us together to worship Him and serve Him, but look how many great friendships have been established just in this local assembly. Oh, I thank God for other churches, and I certainly am friends with many other preachers. Uh, uh, text over 225 every Sunday morning. What a blessing to, to uh, uh, have preacher friends. What a blessing to have uh, uh, folks in other churches. Why do you think we send our kids to these youth camps so they can find out there are other teenagers, there are other young people uh, just like them, serving God, worshiping God, worshiping the same way. Uh, uh, why do you think uh, we encourage folks to get involved in camp meetings and revival meetings so you can find out we're not on an island, that God's got people all over this globe that are serving God and worshiping God and doing something for God. What a privilege uh, to be a part of the family of God, but what a privilege to be in this local assembly. You see, the local church is different than the family of God. Thank God for the family of God. And one of these days we'll all be around the throne of God. But as far as right now on this little hill in Florence, Kentucky, this is the church he's gave us. We ought to be grateful. We ought to certainly contend for the faith. We ought to certainly make certain we're right and that if the Lord calls us out of here individually, we leave something for the next generation because I'm looking around. There's not much hope for a lot of these places. But I'm glad these young people sitting in here they can hear the same gospel I heard when I was their age and the same gospel was preached a uh, hundred years ago and they can have the same, same kind of church in the next generation as long as they stick with governing God's way. What a privilege to be a part of His church. Let me, let me just ask you this. When was the last time you really thanked God for the church? When was the last time you actually thought what your life would be without the church hmm? when was the last time you invited somebody to become part of this church God help us to be thankful for the church alright I'm done brother Clint you come Miss Tina you come to the piano you pick out a song maybe you just need to come tell the Lord you love him maybe tonight you need to come thank him for the church Maybe tonight the Lord just puts somebody on your heart and you need to go to somebody and just hug their neck and say, I'm so glad God let me become your friend. I don't know, but let's all stand. For folks are already coming. They're picking out a song. Why they do is have a word of prayer. Father, we love the church. Thank you for it. Lord, we could go on for hours about the church and really all you've said about it. But Lord, I'm glad for your government on earth. Lord, I know you said, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but unto the Lord what is the Lord's. I'm glad for your government. 
It's far better than the government here on earth. And God, I'm glad you do all things well. Now, Lord, I pray you now just help folks to appreciate the gift you gave them in the church. And Lord, there may be somebody here tonight really struggling. I pray if that's the case, you'd send somebody over by them to just tell them they appreciate them. Maybe encourage them. Maybe there's somebody here tonight unsaved. I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to their heart and they'd come and let somebody take a Bible and show them how to be saved. Lord, whatever the need is, speak to hearts. Bless now. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.